Good morning, everybody. I um, just want to do a quick sound check. I hope everybody can hear me. Uh, someone could maybe just type in their uh, chat box that they've got both audio and visual, and we'll get started here in a few seconds. Great. Okay. Well, uh, I think we're going to get things underway here. Uh, good morning, everybody. My name is Nelson Jatel. I'm the Water Stewardship Director for the Okanagan Basin Water Board. Um, I'd like to welcome everybody to uh, the 2019 Okanagan Water Supply Webinar. This is the seventh year that we've had an opportunity to work with a number of our partners to, to really provide this uh, relatively short communication piece. Um, for over the next hour together, we're going to have an opportunity to view a number of, of pieces. Um, and so um, it's an opportunity today to talk a little bit about not just uh, what are some of the surface hydrology that's going on, but really provide for a uh, more holistic picture that includes uh, groundwater, uh, surface water, and then also some of the climate issues. Uh, we're also going to have an opportunity to hear a little bit about the forest fire forecast for this upcoming year and also a little bit about a, a new information sharing portal uh, that is being piloted out of the city of Kelowna. So just to sort of put context to the date, um, we're sort of in week 16. This is a, a graph of water demand in the Okanagan Basin. Uh, just to show that we're sort of at the beginning stage of this process, we've got um, sort of a snow-dominated hydrograph that gets overlaid onto this, which is sort of our supply. Um, and as most people appreciate, a lot of the demand in the Okanagan really takes place in that um, August-September window when things are, are hot. So we'll be talking about flow today and snowpack storage, uh, some of the uh, levels of Okanagan Lake uh, and provide for an update in terms of what's going on there. We'll have an opportunity to hear a bit about groundwater and really this concept that within the Okanagan Basin, groundwater and source water really make up a, a one water source. <clears throat> and we'll also have an opportunity to talk a little bit about um, both some weather and weather forecasting and some climate uh, uh, conversation pieces. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our presentation team this morning. Um, once again, my name is Nelson Jatel with the Okanagan Basin Water Board, and I'll be providing for a really quick context piece. And then we'll really jump into the, the meat of today's conversation uh, with Dave Campbell from the BC River Forecast Center. Um, Okanagan River and Upper Reservoirs, uh, Sean Reimer will be providing a presentation. Uh, International Soyuz Lake Levels by Martin Succi from uh, Environment and Climate Change Canada. Uh, we've got Doug Lundquist here in the office with me, uh, looking at uh, both weather and some climate variables. Uh, we'll have John Pogson from uh, the Flynn Road uh, team uh, in Penticton, talking about Okanagan groundwater supply. Uh, Robert Warner will be talking about the fire season and some of the readiness that is uh, in preparation stage now. Um, and then Rod McLean from the city of Kelowna is going to be quickly talking about an open data uh, sharing information that uh, supports sharing water supply information, and then a really quick wrap up. Okay, so the whole reason that we have these uh, communication frameworks is largely to be able to support better information, uh, and better information based on better, um, you know, provides better decisions on Okanagan water, uh, whether or not it's water suppliers. Um, agricultural sector leaders um, or researchers. It, it, this provides for sort of a kickoff for the year. Um, this uh, webinar also embraces a regional approach to practical water management issues. Um, there's variation between drainage. Each water source needs its own water management strategies, 
but because we're connected, there's a significant value and benefit of identified coordinated strategies throughout the Okanagan where appropriate. So this is a graph that we show pretty much at the start of every one of these webinars. Each one of these re red bars represents a year's worth of water that come into the Okanagan. Um, you can see that over the last couple of years, 2017 and 18, where we've had flooding events, uh, they have been high in terms of inflows, but they haven't been sort of historical highs, um, which tells you that not only does the amount of water that comes into the region over a year matter, but the timing of that water is incredibly important in terms of how quickly it runs off. Um, what is the influence of uh, storm and localized weather events? Um, the other thing that this graph, I think, illustrates quite clearly is significant variability in the Okanagan. So those low bars, 2003, um, or even looking back further to 1929 to 1932, where we had a three-year drought window, really illustrates that we have some years where we have very, very low flow into the system, and others where we have um, some serious issues around flooding and, and large amounts of water coming through the system. So a very um, variable system in the Okanagan on an annual inflow um, chart. And then we've seen this before in my first slide, but this really is the demand for the Okanagan. And it just um, reiterates that there's uh, sort of an interesting dynamic where we have very little um, use in the winter, and that arguably is our indoor use. You can see sort of on the two shoulders of this graphic. And uh, the, the water uh, demand increases significantly as we get into the summer months, um, and then peters off again as we get into the fall. So, this large volume of water that you see in the middle of the graph, or, or what this represents, uh, is largely outdoor water use in the Okanagan system. So with that, I will turn it over to our first presenter, uh, David Campbell. David. Thanks, Nelson. Can you hear me all right? I can, loud and clear. Great. So if we go to the next slide, I'm just looking at some of the key seasonal drivers this year. Uh, we have been in uh, a weak El Nino uh, condition uh, since about February. We kind of officially hit the threshold, but it's certainly warmer uh, temperatures off the <clears throat> equatorial Pacific for the last five or six months. It's actually been strengthening a little bit the last uh, month or so here. Um, typically in El Ninos, we, we tend to see warmer weather in BC, but it's, it's, it's uh, and then when we get to the precipitation side, it tends to be more variable. Uh, and, you know, just generally as a result with the warmer weather, we do tend to see uh, uh, less snowpack, uh, but also it can be quite variable. So it, because the precipitation is variable, you know, even with a couple degrees warmer, if we if we do get that, um, if it's wetter, we we can get some higher snow. So this is definitely in contrast from the last couple of years where we've been in La Nina, which tend to be more associated with the higher snowpacks and you know potentially wetter uh, weather. Um, you know, we look back to some analogous week El Nino years, uh, the, the spring of 2015 is one that pops up that's uh, quite similar to this year. Uh, but we did see in 2007 where we had a high snowpack year uh, from El Nino. So interestingly, uh, if we go to the next slide, uh, in terms of the weather patterns, and then maybe uh, Doug Lundquist might provide some more detail on this, but really what we saw this year was um, We've got temperature along the top uh, bar and precipitation along the bottom, and then uh, just the last four months. Uh, you know, things were ticking along for the first half of the winter pretty uh, much as we would expect. And then there was a definitely an unusual flip. Uh, then we got into February uh, with kind of dominance of, of, of more Arctic air and extremely cold weather. Uh, and that also brought fairly dry conditions around the province. And those dry conditions have really persisted into March, uh, even though the temperatures have come up. And we did see a, a warmer spell towards the end of March there. Um, and so really, this has been kind of the, the uh, key player this year. Uh, if we go to the next slide, just looking at the snowpack, I uh, really uh, have seen that um, the drier weather has been kind of the uh, that 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 key side of things. So for the most part, uh, things have been fairly uh, slow to accumulate snow. And this is just looking at some of the automated sites around the basin. Uh, and now that we've got into kind of the springtime, uh, warmer weather in March, we did see that kind of more uh, on onset of the freshet season and starting to get melt. So we look at Brenda Mines, 
uh, we've been melting there for a few weeks um, and really starting to push the historic uh, early uh, side of the melt and, and you know really haven't uh, kind of right out tracking along the historic low at this point and, and certainly into the melt season uh, in the mid elevation sites so let's say below 1500 meters as we go to the upper elevation sites we still have seen uh, accumulation and particularly over the last week or two with uh, perhaps transition to more seasonal or even cooler weather, uh, just a little bit of tail end of, of accumulation up at the top. But we have seen the snowpack uh, has been ripening over the last uh, over the last few weeks, and we expect that the, the kind of melt at the upper elevations is probably coming fairly soon um, once we get back into maybe a little bit more of a, a warmer weather spell. So if we go to the next slide, um, kind of at a basin uh, basin scale, uh, we can look at the Okanagan Basin and um, can sort of track how that dry weather has really influenced things. We started in January at 94% of normal. By February, it was 86. March, it was 81%. And, and now for the April survey, it's at 72% of normal. So really have gone from uh, early season indications of a little closer to normal or, or uh, to, to quite a low uh, low snowpack side of things. We can put that into some of the context to, to recent years. As I mentioned before, the last couple of years have been more significant on the snow front side of things. We had almost twice or, or more than twice the amount of snow last year at this time. And again, going back to 2015 has been more of that analogous year for uh, the last time we saw uh, snowpacks that were, were kind of on, on this low uh, end of the spectrum. You know, typically for us, um, I'd say kind of that 65 to 80 percent of normal is kind of the low end and really extremely low would be getting below that 65 uh, percent uh, side of things so we're we're on the low end of the spectrum uh, not uh, necessarily into that extreme uh, and on the low side uh, next slide so certainly from the flood risk perspective this is you know Probably the, the on the good news side of things, obviously a lot less risk coming into this year from the flood side of things, from the snowpack itself. I'll talk more about um, some of the other risk factors, but uh, certainly we we tend to see that risk diminished with the, the lower uh, snowpack side of things. And again, just highlighting um, certainly last year, not only were we extremely high at this time, but it can the snowpack continued to grow uh, as we got into the, the May period. I think this year we're probably on track to uh, uh, see fairly similar snowpacks by the time, or maybe even uh, a little bit lower than we're at right now by the time we get to, to May, depending on how the rest of the month unfolds. Uh, and I think Doug will talk a little bit about the, the, the upcoming weather, so I'll leave that to, to him. Uh, if we go to the next slide, looking at our seasonal inflow forecasts, uh, these are uh, statistical forecasts, so they look at historic uh, patterns in uh, inflow, in snowpack, in precipitation, and uh, based on what we've observed this year, uh, produce a likely scenario for what we would expect to see uh, coming in, and not unexpectedly with the lower snowpack, the, the models suggesting that um, We'd expect to see uh, below normal inflow. It's about 83% of normal for the Okanagan Basin, 67 for, or 60 to 70, 67 to 72% for the Kalamalka Lake side of things. I think it's important to note is the the error on this uh, side of things, and we've seen particularly from 2017 that this forecast can be wildly off, uh, particularly if we're to get a lot of rainfall or not a lot of rainfall through the spring period. So if we look at something that maybe is a likely range, about an 85% chance, which would nominally be plus or minus one uh, standard deviation, you know, we're kind of looking into that more uh, roughly 60 to 100 percent of normal uh, flow and obviously there still is that risk uh, of having higher flows if if we're to get that uh, side of things um, there's been some discussion about you know what can we do about trying to incorporate seasonal rainfall forecasting into this uh, process and you know really it's it's challenging both in terms of the skill of uh, seasonal rainfall forecasts um, it's really difficult to kind of do that foreshadowing of what what to expect on that side of things. We we know that the season uh, that we're coming into is the wet season through uh, the South Interior, so it's certainly possible that we can uh, see uh, that rainfall coming in. And we look at it just sort of on a general basis. Um, you know, we do tend to get probably. And I'm just throwing this as a ballpark number. About uh, 10 to 40 percent of the inflow that we see, at least, is is coming from that rainfall components. It's obviously a big part of the seasonal inflow uh, through the region. Uh, next slide. 
Uh, we do have our ensemble forecast that we've been trying to get running over the last couple of years. Uh, this is another way to uh, look at future inflow. And we do this based on running historical weather scenarios uh, through hydrologic, hydrologic model. And uh, we knew it now have the inclusion of the 2017 conditions in this. So it, it does give an idea of what the likelihood of something like that happening uh, again might be. Uh, this model seems to be producing higher inflows than are predicted through the statistical model. Uh, it's hard to know whether that's um, being influenced by some of the inclusion of some of these spring rainfall events or or whether it's uh, just the model's not capturing that lower snow the way that it is. Uh, important to note then really that, that there still is that chance again of uh, some of these high uh, rainfall scenarios uh, happening and, and, and could lead to some significant inflow, but really that's not what is the, the most likely scenario, the expected scenario. Um, another thing that's sort of important that's coming out of this, we're seeing it again that melt at the, the mid elevation sites. The model's picking that up as well. It's it's really indicating a shift in terms of the the snow melt with uh, favoring kind of peak inflow through the April May period uh, in contrast to the typical May June period. So um, some of that advance and freshet that, that we're we're at right now in terms of you know two to four weeks in some areas is expected to come and 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 play a role as we go forward in terms of. Uh, the onset of, uh, or just the, how, the timing of how that, that water comes down. Next slide. So in terms of the outlook, uh, and again, I think Doug will touch, touch on this more uh, in, in detail, really we're, we are seeing the weighted side of things towards uh, warmer than normal uh, temperatures through the spring. And that's in line with uh, the El Nino that's currently here and expected to persist into the spring and maybe even into the summer. Um, so from that side of things, definitely, I think that leads us to think that that ongoing early freshet uh, and, and earlier seasonal uh, melt is, is 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 the case and particularly with the lower uh, snow snowpack side of things you know it, it will lead to kind of lower uh, earlier um, push into the to the low flow side of things uh, and so I think that's one of the key sides of things is you know low snow uh, early melt and warmer weather does start to push us more towards that uh, increased risk of the summer low flow side of things. And then obviously, I think it's important to note again that, that the weather is very much a key driver uh, for both the flood and the drought side of things. What we get over the next uh, two and three months uh, is, is critical to whether or not we see any uh, flood issues or, uh, or low flows. And so I'd certainly um, preface the point that, you know, in years of low flow, or sorry, low snowpack, flooding is absolutely a, a possibility still with these higher uh, extreme rainfall events. And then on the flip side, um, that rain can can alleviate some of the stress that's put on from the snowpack to the low flow side of things. So really looking to that weather as we go through the spring and summer is going to be critical for what we ultimately get in the end. So with that, I'll pack, pass it back to uh, you, Nelson. Thanks. Thanks so much, Dave. That was excellent. Um, our next presenter is Sean Reimer uh, from Flinroe RD. Good morning, everyone. So I'll just talk morning, about uh, I'll just talk about some of the uh, the lake levels and and, and sort of build off uh, a little bit of what uh, David was already saying. So um, this is just a, an elevation chart of where uh, Okanagan Lake is uh, for this year. Um, the dashed blue line is uh, the median elevation, and it corresponds very uh, closely actually to the uh, sort of uh, historic average as well. Um, you can see that right now we're probably about 15 centimeters higher than average or median. And um, again, this is something that is probably a good thing for this year um, based on the data that we're seeing now uh, and, and all the dry conditions. Um, you know, that we've been experiencing over the winter. Uh, so you can also see the indications of, of that, some of that early melt and some of the uh, uh, sporadic kind of rainfall that we've been getting in the last little few weeks uh, where Okanagan Lake is beginning to rise uh, somewhat slowly. Uh, we would expect it at this point to continue to rise more slowly for another few weeks uh, before we get into the, the full-on freshet um, lake rise. So uh, next slide, please. And these are our Okanagan Lake outflows uh, from the Water Survey of Canada gauge uh, in the Okanagan River at Penticton. And it just shows us where we've been uh, at this year. 
Again, the blue dashed line is, is a median flow. So we've been a little bit higher uh, than we would for, um, again, sort of average conditions, um, but still fairly moderate to minimal flows uh, compared to where we might be. Um, over the last couple of years, for sure, uh, you know, we have our fisheries threshold where we can um, maintain it is, is below 28 cubic meters per second. So we're certainly well below that. And projecting forward um, and, and, and thinking that we're going to be trying to capture water this year rather than try to uh, get all the water uh, out of the lake in anticipation of a, a large snow melt, um, you know, we're, we're going to be keeping the uh, outflows fairly minimal. Um, again, probably for the entirety of the freshet, at least based on uh, the data we're getting now. Um, but as long as things sort out like we expect them to at this point, uh, it, it certainly will give us a little bit of flexibility to increase flows if we do start seeing um, higher rates of rainfall or, or, and precipitation. Uh, next slide. So these are the inflows that we've seen for the uh, current water year. So again, these charts are, are starting uh, last October. Uh, the bottom right shows the cumulative uh, in, the, in the blue, it shows the cumulative inflows, and these are in uh, million cubic meters per second, or sorry, million cubic meters, uh, and, and, and done sort of on a weekly basis. Um, although we're tracking a little bit higher than normal uh, cumulatively, um, when you look at the top left chart and, and, and it shows the weekly inflows, you can see that a large part of that was probably due to a, a significant week-long rain event back in uh, October of 2018. And certainly over the last, since January, uh, we've had, in, in some cases, negative inflows into the lake. And I've just lost my, uh, my screen here. I uh, just lost the screen on the webinar, so I'll um, try to work off memory. Uh, right, yeah. So the next slide. So the, the next slide I have shows, uh, again, it's a bit of a, a recap of the uh, River Forecast Center uh, inflow projections. And it shows what uh, the forecasts have been in for uh, seasonally um, starting in February of this year. And again, each one of these is February to July. So um, the, the latest one we've had was for 379 million cubic meters of water coming in. Uh, but to put that in perspective, that is ab about 110 centimeters of water uh, coming into the lake being projected. And right now uh, we are 77 centimeters below full pool. So um, as you can imagine, it, it really leaves only not that much water that we have to pass through uh, the system. And this is telling us that it's going to be probably more difficult to reach full pool, uh, our target level, than to be worrying about flooding that happens above, uh, getting above that. Again, weather conditions will dictate what ultimately what happens. But uh, right now, our strategy is to be going minimal outflows and trying to capture as, as, as much water as possible. So um, like I say, uh, precipitation is going to be the key going forward. But we do have uh, certainly some room to maneuver this year. Uh, our conditions are certainly seem to be more similar to 2015 and a little bit more like 2016. Uh, when actually the lake was higher uh, for those periods than, than it is this year. So um, that's about all I have uh, for now. Thanks so much, Sean. Sorry about that hiccup. Um, next up is Martin Suki from International Soyuz uh, uh, IJC uh, group, and uh, he comes from um, Environment and Climate Change Canada. Uh, Martin. Uh, thanks, Nelson. Um, so starting off on the first slide, uh, there we go. So uh, just a quick update. Um, the International Soyuz Lake uh, Board of Control, uh, the board was established uh, by order of the International Joint Commission, the IJC, back in 1946. 
uh, basically to ensure the implementation of the provisions of that order uh, relative to any alterations in operation of, of Zozal Dam uh, on Osoyoz Lake. So um, currently uh, we are uh, using the 2013 supplementary order of approval um, and uh, that is what the operator uh, must uh, operate the dam in compliance with. So lake levels in Osorius Lake are generally regulated by Zozal Dam, uh, located uh, near uh, Oroville. Uh, however, during uh, freshet periods, uh, the Similkameen River, which inflows uh, down, downstream of, uh, of the dam, does uh, or can have uh, create backwater effects uh, on the lake, and I will speak to that a bit later. Uh, next slide, please. So current uh, membership of the board, uh, there was no changes in 2018 other than uh, myself. I uh, replaced Gwyn Graham, uh, who was also with the Environment Climate Change Canada as the Canadian Section Secretary uh, in, in um, October 2018. And uh, coming up, looking forward from 2019, uh, Dave Hutchinson with the Environment Climate Change Canada, MSC, uh, will likely be uh, nominated um, for the Canadian section co-chair. Uh, yep, otherwise no changes. Next slide. So uh, just a little overview here of the basins. Um, so we got an update there from Sean Reimer that operates the, uh, the Okanagan uh, Lake Dam. You see the Zozal Dam close uh, on, uh, in Washington State, just uh, south of the border. Um, and then we have uh, the Similkameen Basin uh, and the Similkameen River, which uh, flows in uh, into uh, Okanogan River down, downstream of, uh, of the dam. And uh, so, so the, the, the water uh, inputs into Soyuz Lake um, are uh, from uh, Okanagan Lake, uh, but there are so uh, tributaries uh, between the dam and, Pen and um, Oliver, and uh, those tributaries during freshet can account for, uh, you know, up to 65 cubic meters per second uh, difference. So uh, they can be uh, substantial uh, inputs. And I just also wanted to mention that the uh, Okanagan Lake operator, Oak, uh, dam operators, and uh, Sean Reimer and, and Al Giuseppe of uh, Washington Department of Ecology, who operate the Zozal Dam, uh, speak regularly and, um, and definitely coordinate their uh, activities uh, as, as best they can. Next slide, please. Uh, here we just we have uh, Oliver. We have uh, stream uh, Okanagan River discharge uh, at Oliver. So just a recap of 2018, we saw um, historical highs in both April and in May, uh, and um, and currently for 2019, uh, we are discharges or, or discharges uh, is close to the mean. Uh, to the current April 12th uh, discharge is 17.8 uh, cubic meters per second which compares to a, uh, uh, a historical mean for the day of, of 20.3 uh, cubic meters per second. Uh, flows have been unchanged mostly since, uh, since late February. Uh, they were reduced, uh, flows were reduced as you see in early February due to um, uh, an ice jam at Zozal Dam uh, in which the uh, Okanagan Lake um, Outflows were reduced to help try and uh, clear the dam and at, at Zozal Dam, uh, the, clear the ice jam at, at Zozal Dam and uh, uh, maintain kind of lower levels because they had started climbing. Uh, next slide, please. So this is uh, Okanogan River discharge at Oroville, so downstream of the dam. So uh, similar discharges to the Oliver plot I'd shown you. Um, the only difference is, is uh, any retention or uh, discharge of water from uh, Soyuz Lake based on um, uh, dam operations. Um, so current uh, conditions, we are at uh, 519 cubic feet per second, so that's 14.7 uh, cubic meters per second. Uh, the historical uh, mean for uh, this date period is uh, around 740 cubic feet per second. So 21.1 uh, cubic meters per second. 
Uh, next slide, please. Right, so this is uh, really the key slide here. So um, looking back at 2018, uh, we had um, flows that uh, peaked on May 12th, or sorry, lake levels that peaked uh, on May 12th uh, on a Sporosoyus Lake at 916.45 feet. Um, that was the third highest uh, lake level on record since the USGS International Gauge uh, began measurements in 1928. Uh, and it was the fourth highest if you include the flood uh, levels of uh, 1894, which were uh, almost uh, 919 feet. Um, so for 2018, uh, Osiris Lake levels were within the rule curve, except for the period uh, between April 27th and June 28th due to high runoff uh, during spring freshet. During this time, Osiris Lake levels were not controlled by the dam. Gates were fully open and any exceedances above 912 feet, uh, which is allowable under the order, uh, condition eight, uh, were due to um, natural inflows. Um, the maximum daily, yeah, right, so we've got that. And then uh, currently for um, 2019, uh, current level uh, as of today was uh, 910.51 feet. Uh, the operator is targeting uh, 911.5 feet by June 1st, uh, although this, um, this target may not be met. Uh, lake levels have been climbing of late, uh, but they are variable uh, due to um, a, a couple things. Uh, one is um, uh, Washington Governor Jane's lead declared dro a drought emergency for four basins in Washington State, including the Okanogan, in early May. Uh, sorry, in early April, uh, and so there was some response to the um, dam operations because of that. Uh, but, uh, and then the other thing is the, um, uh, the International Soyuz Lake Board of Control um, is not declaring a drought for a Soyuz Lake uh, because uh, although the similkameen uh, discharge uh, criteria are met uh, for drought conditions, they are not met for Okanagan Lake uh, as of the April 1st update. Uh, this will be revisited again in early April. Um, however, there is a possibility uh, under the order of something called Condition 10, uh, which uh, is a variance that would have to be approved by the IJC, uh, similar to what happened in 2015, uh, which would allow the operator to uh, operate uh, summer lake levels up to 912.5 feet. So an extra half a foot of uh, storage in the lake to meet uh, both in-stream demand and uh, irrigation demand um, downstream. Uh, that's it for me, thank you. Martin, thank you very much, that was excellent. Um, next up, we have Doug Lundquist from Environment and Climate Change Canada. Climate change. Good morning, everybody. Uh, I hear already that uh, we have a low snowpack, which concerned me, and it was nice to hear from the River Forecast Center. I'm going to bring it down more into the valley, and I'm going to tell you right now what the big things are. Spring is starting quite dry, but as we have said, the rains of May and June, which are our wettest months of the year, are critical for the summer water supply. I have some concerns, too, uh, about climate change. Is the length of time between the end of early summer rains and the fall storms increasing? Is, is the world becoming a different place? Are we f facing different challenges than we have uh, in past decades? And uh, remember that long, longer hot dry periods, especially in the latter half of summer, can really cause water supply issues. So just to uh, recap the winter here, uh, it was overall, like uh, Dave said there, it started out really warm. We didn't actually have winter until Marmot's Day or Groundhog's Day, uh, when the Arctic front finally went through the Okanagan and the month of February was really much colder than average. So it was so much colder than average that it outweighed the month of December and January. And the winter ended up colder than average. So just looking at the three main centers there in the Okanagan, Vernon's winter was probably about a degree below average. Same in Kelowna and Penticton about one and a half. Uh, from the precipitation side, it was dry. So looking at Vernon, 71 millimeters throughout the winter, usually get about 113 
Look at Kelowna there, 41 versus the average of 80. So that's about half of what we usually get. And in Penticton, 55, the average 76. So it was definitely a cold and dry winter. And uh, our thinking about El Nino, and the reason I didn't even mention El Nino is that it was so weak in El Nino, at least during the winter months, that the teleconnections didn't happen between South America and British Columbia. So I ended up being cold and dry. I uh, just wanted to include the month of March here because even though March is considered the first month of spring, it was so dry that if you go back to the beginning of winter and continue up to just a few weeks ago, uh, the box, red box there is across our region, we were really quite dry. Those shades of brown are way below average, I think something like in the 50% uh, range plus or minus. So it certainly was dry from December through to March. Now you want to know what's going forward. That's the main reason Environment Canada is here, at least from the weather perspective. We want to let you know what's coming up. Well, the next week or so is looking pretty close to average. It's pretty normal with some showers here and there, maybe some rain at times and some sun mixed in. Uh, overall, pretty close to average for this time of year. Uh, I think even if you look back to the month of March where it was really warm at the end, we've cooled off some since then, but we're still near or slightly above average for temperature but that kind of weather pattern is what we more typically might see for this time of year heading forward i'm going to show you here the next slide this is mid-april through mid-may for temperature and that black box is our region and it's neither showing uh we're in the above average temperature category or below average so it couldn't pick between the two or there's actually a third which is near near average and so uh Basically, the models couldn't decide which of the three categories is going to happen. So anything's up in the air, and I think that means for the next month or so, uh, we you know we might see things closer to average perhaps at times, but it isn't clear yet what will happen beyond a couple of weeks here into early May. That being said, though, this is the temperature outlook for April all the way through to June, which is the last two months of spring and the first month of summer. And if you look at British Columbia there, that's basically that northwestern part that's very, very red. I see my scale has fallen off the screen, but basically the darkest reddish color there, burgundy, is 90 to 100% chance that that period would be above average for temperature. And even for southern BC there, was a, where it's a slightly lighter color of red, that's 80 to 90% chance that'll be warmer than average from April through to June. And uh, you'll notice that I don't really talk much about precipitation, and that's because beyond just a few weeks, it's very difficult to forecast. But there's certainly is stuff we can glean out of this. We're starting out from a dry perspective, which always has me concerned. The outlook has a very high probability of a hot spring and early summer, which will lead to more evapotranspiration and thus a diminishing water supply. People will want to be watered. That graph that Nelson shows us might be out over the top there if it continues to be dry and ends up being hot here in the next few months. Remember that May and June are our critical rain period here in the BC interior. It's the rainiest part of the year and we need that rain to kind of sustain us through summer. But that being said, we also are really wondering how much rain will get. It's more spotty as we get into the summer period, more convective in nature. So we're wondering about summer rains getting us through the problem as well. And again, I remind you the long range precipitation forecasts are pretty poor. That's why you have to keep plugged into Environment Canada, the forecast. And actually, uh, we have a way you can sign up for special notifications that the warning preparedness meteorologists put out. And if you're interested in getting out, getting onto our mailing list for these, we put them out before the warnings and, and uh, advisories come out. If you're interested in that, perhaps send me an email or get a hold of Nelson to connect with me. My email is just my name, Doug dot Lundquist, that's L-U-N-D-Q-U-I-S-T, at Canada.ca. So uh, anyway, hopefully everybody has a great summer and uh, we get some rain throughout the rainy season. Thanks a lot, Doug. That was great. Uh, our next speaker is going to be John Bugson from the province of British Columbia, uh, and we'll have an opportunity to hear about groundwater. Thanks, Nelson. Uh, just by way of an introduction, I guess uh, the Ministry maintains a network of groundwater observation wells throughout the Okanagan, uh, which is where this data comes from, and, and, and the province uh, on the whole. Um, so these observation wells record water level fluctuations 
which uh, in turn allow us to better understand how aquifers respond to changes in climate, precipitation, and the effects of pumping. Um, next slide, please. Great. So before we before we dive in, I'll just sort of orient you because there are a lot of a lot of colorful lines on this this diagram. We've got a map to the left to orient yourself within the valley. Um, in terms of the color coding, um, the, uh, the the magenta or pinky colored line represents the 2019 data. Uh, historical data is uh, represented last year, 2018, as the light green or lime colored line. And then we've got the average, historical average for the period of record in that blue. And then bounding all of that are the historical uh, mins and maxes. And at the bottom of the, the slide, you'll find the, uh, the full period of record uh, with the start date and then, of course, the, the associated data for that. So, all right, let's start the journey. 118, up in Armstrong. Um, this well has a relatively long period of record. Uh, 2019 levels um, are tracking more or less a meter higher than those observed last year and above historical averages. Um, they're high relative to the last decade, but over the full period of record, um, levels are lower than those, those historical uh, maximums. So, moving on to the next slide. Alumchine, uh, observation level 180. Uh, 2019 levels are generally similar to those seen in 2018, uh, similar to 20, uh, similar to 118, which we just talked about up in Armstrong. Um, we're seeing that increasing over the last decade or so, but still sort of remains sort of similar to or depressed against the historical average for the full period of record. Next slide, please. Moving down the valley to Winfield, um, located on a, just a little bit north of Ellison Lake in Lake Country. 2019 levels are currently approximately a meter below um, what we saw last year in 2018, but they still maintain a strong positive difference over the historical averages for the period of record. Next slide. 442 Ellison, uh, for, for orientation, that's just near the airport in Kelowna. 2019 levels are seeming to build on the record-breaking highs that we saw in 2018 um, at this particular well, but I will note uh, for, for people at home that the period of record for this well is relatively short, uh, starting in 2014. So I'll, uh, I'll leave it at that. Moving on to the next slide, please. Bringing us to Rutland in Kelowna. Again, a, a relatively long period of record at about 40 years. Uh, 2019 levels are currently in excess of about a meter higher than those observed in 2018 and above um, sort of, yeah, above 2018, but they do remain lower than the historical average. Um, you will notice that they are sort of climbing over the last sort of four to five years, but relative to the, the full period of record, they are somewhat uh, depressed. Next slide. Moving quite a bit further down the valley, closer to where I'm sitting in Penticton, at Twin Lakes. Um, after last year, we saw some record-breaking uh, levels, 2018, and at this well, those levels continued um, on that, that record-breaking trend, although declining and starting to sort of join in with what we saw as historical maxes. Um, although you can see the graph starting to decline, we are seeing an inflection at the end, which probably suggests we're starting to get into those recharge conditions, so we'll keep an eye on that well. Next slide, please. Willowbrook, which was the site of some flooding, uh, much like much of the valley last year. Um, current levels are elevated against historical averages, uh, but apparently uh, departing from the record-breaking trend that we did see in 2018. Uh, similar to Twin Lakes, we'll be keeping an eye on this one as well. Next slide, please. 407 to Colnewitt, back into the, the valley proper. Although levels started um, for this year a little higher than those observed in 2018, it's starting to become a lot better behaved and, and falling in line with the script, sticking to those historical averages. And my last, my last hydrograph, next slide. Uh, Anarchist Mountain, this is a, a high level, high elevation observation well. 
Um, and the purpose of this one is to, to monitor the effects of recharge and climate change. So over the winter, we saw some new uh, historical highs, um, or sorry, historical minimums uh, develop at this well. Um, but this well doesn't usually show its true character until a little bit later in the season. And in fact, uh, these slides were created last week, and I looked at this well this morning, and it's already started to uh, show an increase of a little bit over a meter in its uh, depth. So it's going to start to come back into uh, that, that average range uh, probably over the next few weeks as we get the warmer temperatures that Doug was talking about. Next slide, please. So the story is a little bit varied, but generally speaking, water levels are higher than nor uh, the long-term averages within the valley. There are some you know, noted exceptions like 407 in Tacolnuit and 236 in Rutland. Uh, high elevation wells, although reporting lower than uh, historical averages recently, as I said, this, this morning I've already seen a change, so this may be a little bit of a stale update with respect to the high elevation. Um, observation wells. And then historical high water levels um, set during the winter at some of the wells that we have in the south and central Okanagan. And examples of those would be Ellison, which I showed you, and uh, 403 as well. And last slide. Great. So all of this information is publicly available. Uh, it can be accessed through the groundwater level data interactive map. Uh, there's a link there. Um, there's also a recently re uh, released report for State of the Environment, so I encourage everyone to take a look at that if you're interested in groundwater across the province. And if you need any other information, you can re reach myself at the, uh, at the coordinates below. Thanks, Nelson. Back to you. John, thank you very much. That was an excellent presentation. Um, our next speaker up is going to be Bob, uh, Bob Warner uh, with Row RD. Talking a little bit about the forecast for uh, this upcoming summer of fires. Thanks, Nelson. Good morning, everybody. Uh, 2019. I'd like to show a couple of slides of what uh, last happened the last couple of years to compare the see how they relate they stack up relative to each other and as a history, and uh, give a brief outlook of what's what we think is going to happen in 2019. And uh, the slides I've got here are supplied by. BC Wildfire Service Communication Brands, and they have their own predictive services group. And you may have seen some of them at the uh, EMBC preparedness uh, sessions that were held earlier this year. Uh, next slide, please. So it's 17 and 18 season were, were historic, uh, as, as we all know. Uh, lightning caused fires were 75% of the fires that were caused. Um, we're seeing the starts that are, that are more, they're more, more volatile because of conditions on the ground, i.e. Uh, dry conditions and uh, heavy fuel loads. And it, it, we could contribute some of that to the pine beetle, but there's just a lot of fuel load, load, loads out there. The area has burned out the last two years. Uh, again, fuel loads, significant uh, be fire behavior led to suppression challenges. So when a fire explodes quickly, uh, it's hard to get the number of bodies on it that need to get it to control. And uh, once it gets going, it's hard to stop. Um, suppression costs. So spending more on prevention and fuel mitigation to lessen the risk and behavior, uh, which will see less suppression challenges and costs. Uh, you may, may have heard that the, the base budget is in, increased from 64 million to 101 million. And that's just base, so that's obviously not um, the fire cost, the, the base, but the year-round base. Uh, looking at $60 million in community resilience investment program, uh, so that's focusing on prevention and creating research and innovation team, and just getting more type two contractors and uh, increasing training for our contract crews. Um, follow, next slide, please. This one is. Uh, I find quite astounding for me is the, as you look, the green line is the uh, area area burnt in hectares. Um, the, the red line is the uh, number of fires. Um, the yellow the yellow dotted line is the average hectares burnt, which is about 154,000 uh, hectares, and the pink dotted is the average number of fires, which is about 2,100. 
So you look at the, on the far left there, the, the year is 1994, where it's a little spike there. And, you know, that's a Garnet fire. We all thought that was pretty big. And then uh, further along, 2003, Okanagan Mountain Park, that was pretty big. Uh, locally, 2009, Terrace Mountain and West Kelowna fires, those are big years as well. Uh, 2015, we had the big drought. Um, that was that was a big year as well. But then you look at 2017-18, they just skyrocket. Um, they, they pale in comparison. So again, the, 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 the caribou had the, the large, vast amount of fuel types that were that were and gra grass types as well, um, which led to the quick quick explosion of the fires. And this year we had a uh, sorry, this year, 2018 we had uh, up 70,000 uh, lightning strikes in a one week span. So you can imagine the uh, the challenges that prevent of actioning all those promptly. Uh, next slide, please. So the short term weather uh, wildfire conditions. Uh, so as, as we've heard, the temperatures are marked and near normal for this time of year. Uh, when, we're, when we're looking at fire conditions, uh, snow melt obviously helps the higher relative humidity, which keeps things moist. Um, so but having said that, Conditions are white for grass fires, as, as untrimmed grasses will, will are easy, easy to ignite. And uh, right now, we're, uh, the window is closing pretty quickly, but we're still in favorable conditions for for broadcast burning or uh, prescribed burning. Uh, we just there was one that was done recently at, at uh, Crater Mountain; it was quite successful. Uh, and the great it's a great time to do burning now, is because it's it, it is. The fuels are still moist, and the, the overnight recovery is high, so we can the, 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 ask the uh, risk of spread is quite low. And uh, next slide, please. The spring outlook. So the next three months, so as, as we've heard, the average is low average snowpacks, uh, above normal temperatures, above normal temperatures, um, and below normal precipitation. So that, that all means we're all going to get it's going to happen earlier freshet, and when that happens, it's pointed out that it's going to be a longer a longer fire season. So when we have a longer fire season, the risk is higher. Uh, next slide, please. And summer again, a consistent theme here is uh, we've got the above seasonal temperatures expected, but we have low confidence in precipitation forecasts. Um, the trend is slightly higher towards more normal amounts, but we won't hang our hand on that. We're still seeing signs that the fire season is likely to be busier than normal. Uh, we recognize that we don't, we're not saying 2017-18 are going to are, uh, are be the new norm yet, but and they're still being considered outliers at this point, but uh, uh, we still are concerned about this year for sure. Next slide, please. Of course, the caveat is the actual fire severity of the season will be highly dependent on local short-range patterns such as timing and amount of rainfall, length of drying periods, thunderstorms, and wind events. And we can't we can't forecast these events for in advance. Um, so again, it's just uh, the trends are pointing towards that, but uh, things can change. Uh, and if you have any questions. Uh, my my email address is robert warner at gov bc ca. Thanks, thank you. Thanks so much, Bob. That was excellent. That was excellent. Um, our next presenter is Rod McLean from the City of Kelowna, who's going to give us just a really quick uh, overview of some of the new um, data management tools that are coming out of the local government uh, to impart share water supply and water information. Rod. Hi, Nelson. You can hear me? I can, loud and clear. Perfect. Okay, thank you. Um, Nelson asked me just to do a little uh, little update here with a couple of slides on what we're doing here at the city. Um, in 2017, the city started getting a little bit more into analytics on on uh, water supply lake level as, and this started very quickly as the lake levels were beginning to rise and nobody knew what was going on publicly. Uh, last year, the, what you see right now here was a series of uh, 
summaries of various lake levels uh, available to us, and we had a package and a dashboard of uh, of data that's been scrubbed and obtained from different communities and grouped to our own requirements as part of the Emergency Operations Center. And so last year we we kept this internally to our partners uh, with the uh, Emergency Operations Center. And of course, as we've gone further into the data management system or, or time series data management at the city, we're beginning to we're beginning to introduce our own community-based uh, processes. This particular database has been passed around to many of our uh, communities in the last week or so. So some of you may or may not have access to it yet. And if you don't, I'll give you my email at the end of our, our little presentation here. However, we are making this entire process at least accessible online. Uh, Below, we've also, in in addition to what we had in 2018, we also have additional tabs that we continue to do, and they're on the bottom, uh, maps, snow, hydrographs, lake level changes, and uh, comparing flow rates. These are tools that we've always, that we've been using. Please to the next uh, slide. So internally at the city, and this takes a long time, and it's something that uh, we are beginning to develop a template for, but essentially we are looking to make a lot of our information, time series information that we have on our SCADA system live. So we have a variety of weather stations uh, throughout, the, throughout the city. We also have uh, flow monitoring stations, and we also host other people's flow monitoring stations. And we're beginning to come up with our own, our own community level uh, uh, time series data portal. And we just opened that two weeks ago. And we actually have two, two scrub files in there. Plus we also have uh, live time series data off of two of our uh, processes. This has taken a full year to develop as, as, you can, as you can see by all the squiggles. But essentially the goal is 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 to make sure that all of our processes are no longer going into our SCADA system, but actually go through our uh, open data portals uh, around and through our firewall. And in the future, we're hoping that uh, in working with the regional districts, Okanagan Basin Water Board and other communities, we'll have a consistent open data um, process. So my email, if you do not have access and would like access to the uh, to the uh, dashboard, is just call me at uh, or email me at r maclean r m a c l e a n at colona.ca, and I'll be glad to uh, give you something. All right, thank you. Rod, thank you very much. That was excellent. Uh, I see that we're um, right at uh, 11.59. It's always a marvel to see how this presentation uh, fits into the hour that we allocate for it. Uh, I want to thank uh, sincerely all of our presenters uh, this morning. It was absolutely excellent to be able to get the experts online and provide this information across the valley. I just want to remind everybody that um, this presentation has been recorded uh, and there'll be an opportunity if you want to be able to uh, download it and see both the slide presentation and obviously hear the audio with it. Uh, that'll be available to you, and uh, we'll make sure that we email that around. If anybody's interested, they can always uh, get a hold of our office if they don't see it in the next uh, few hours here. Um, and with that, um, I wish everybody a uh, great day and a great weekend, and um, thank everybody so much for participating in uh, this year's Okanagan Water Supply Webinar. Have a great day, everybody.